Okay, so uh, let's start. So um, I give you a bit of an introduction into what we can do with um, microbial genomes, particularly isolated from ancient material, what kind of questions we can address and how we proceed there. Um, and what we want to do now, let me just start sharing my slides um, in this session. Okay, so you should now see uh, my screen with the slides. Um, what we want to do today is look a bit at uh, genome mapping. And what does that uh, actually mean? As you have already gone uh, through your practical session for eager, and eager is uh, an NGS processing pipeline. There are uh, many NGS processing pipelines out there, but eager is specifically targeting the use case of processing um, ancient genomes. May they be human or bacterial microbial genomes. Um, and what these uh, NGS processing pipelines do for you is basically connecting uh, a number of analytical steps under the hood. And what we want to do uh, now in this practical session is look a bit under the hood and see the process that is actually usually managed for you by such uh, NGS processing pipelines. Um, and we have picked here the most crucial steps, which is uh, mapping of reads to a reference genome um, and also the process of uh, genotyping and uh, first steps into comparative genomics. Um, and this is something that we uh, that we would like to show you because, first of all, not always might you have an environment available where such an NGS pipeline does this for you. Or you might even be in a situation where you want to set up your own pipeline, where you really want to see the individual steps that are happening or where you have a very custom use case. So what we will uh, do today is guide you through each of these individual steps that are actually usually happening under the hood in the context of genome mapping and the most important steps that follow after that. So first of all, what is uh, actually mapping? Um, a few introductory slides about what we are actually talking about. So um, this is the alignment of DNA sequences uh, to a reference genome, particularly DNA sequencing reads. So we are not talking about uh, whole genes or other kind of genetic elements, but rather reads that come from a sequencing machine. And this is suitable for comparing rather closely related genomes. So if you have genomes that are very distantly related, this will actually not work because the uh, similarity is not high enough to actually be able to, um, uh, to perform the mapping. What we then want to do from that is uh, identification of variants would then serve as input for downstream analysis. And this can be phylogenomics or function analysis. And this will be a topic in other practical um, sessions. So um, what are actually sequence alignments? So that's what we see on the next slide. Um, thank you. So that looks actually good. So this is just some, some basics also coming back to uh, a terminology that I used earlier. So the, what is an edit distance? If you basically align two sequences with each other, this basically means that um, you try to figure out what is the lowest number of modifications that you have to apply to one sequence to turn it into the other. Um, and these modifications, these uh, may they be exchange of a character or the insertion or deletion of a character, um, the number of modifications is then called the edit distance. So if we then go ahead, what is the mapping concept? So we basically start, it's just a schematic, we start with many sequencing reads. So when I say many, then I'm talking about millions. Um, and we start with a, with a reference genome. Reference genome will be um, basically a long string of nucleotide characters. So also there we are talking about millions of uh, such characters in the case of a bacterial genome. And then we want to align our reads. And what this means is that for every read, we want to basically find the position in the genome that this read is most um, similar to. And we will do this for all the reads. And they will basically start accumulating uh, on the genome 
And then what we finally will get is reads that do actually differ from the genome. So where we have a so-called uh, single nuclear, uh, nucle uh, sorry, nucleotide polymorphism. Um, so that means we have a different nucleotide in our reads compared to the reference genome. And actually those uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, these SNPs is what we are interested in. We can also see other types of variation, for example, uh, deletions, so where a read does not contain all of the sequence information that we find in the genome. And these deletions can be of high uh, relevance, but when we talk about phylogenetics, we are mostly interested in single nucleotide variation. So the, the input format for our mapping is actually FASTQ, and um, I will just show this very quickly. Uh, so this is basically a combination of a sequence and quality. So this is the FASTQ format. This is an actual extract from a, a FASTQ file. So we have the uh, ID of a sequencing read. We have basically the nucleotide sequence, and then we have another line of quality values. And now you see just characters, right? You see a star and parentheses and percent and plus and whatnot. But these characters basically encode the sequencing quality of each nucleotide in the read. And how the encoding works is what you actually see here. Um, so there are different encoding schemes. Now, this is actually something that none of us really has to understand. I just want to uh, show this to you to make clear there is not just one type of encoding, but there are many types of encoding. Um, but uh, if you see the scales, they actually go roughly from zero to 40. And this is um, a logarithmic scale that indicates error probability. So basically, the higher the score is, the lower is the probability that this nucleotide has actually been an error or uh, erroneously sequenced. Um, these quality scores can then be visualized, and this is, for example, done by a tool called FASTQC that is uh, through multiple positions in the read, in this case here, in a cumulative way, um, summarizing all the quality values at this position over all reads, and here then showing this as a box plot. Um, we picked here an example that is particularly bad, so you basically see the sequencing quality dropping towards the end um, of the reads. And this it should actually rather not look like what we see here. But it would be good if the majority of sequencing qualities would stay in, in this area that is highlighted. So this is the, the basics. So basically, you will start with these so-called FASTQ files. Um, and this is also our kind of material for today. And now we will move um, slowly into the practical part. So I hope you can all hear me well. So um, I would like, so first thing, um, I think everybody has recovered the data that might have been lost for some of you. But um, I think we are still all running this first command. Um, I just keep it on the slide here. But what you are going to do is basically, sorry, um, go into your um, terminal which I hope you have opened. And um, you're in basically, that's a bunch of stuff. And what you, I would like you to do is first run this command that you might, maybe you have run that also yesterday um, to recover day four um, material if it's not anyways there. Um, so wait a bit until you've done. And please like, um, I'll ask if you're done if somebody's not done, just speak up. In, in any classes in my chat copy it. Ah, ich hab's nicht rein. So we can also copy that into a chat, I just realized. So it's in the chat now. I think for most of you it won't do anything if the data is there, but just run it just to make sure. Yeah. So, 
So we hope to see that everyone has a nice green message saying all is fine and just listen to the instructions, instructors. Yeah, I can actually also run it, I think. So it says, yeah, we are good to go exiting now because I still have everything. Um, shall I move on or is anybody still stuck with something? So basically, everybody should see this nice green message that tells you we are good to go. So if anyone is, if anyone's screen is saying it's downloading or you got a red message, can you raise your hand? Yeah. You have five seconds. <laughs> Looks good, I guess. So Nora is saying I don't have to send files in the directory. Um, the thing is, I think we're not in. Sorry, I hear an echo, Alexander. Uh, OK, thanks. So we are not in our directory yet. Uh, so we will go there in the next step. Exactly. That could look different for anybody. So the next thing is actually now we see the, we change directory into uh, where we want to go. So change directory, volume, maybe I put it in a chat as well. Um, and then do it myself. So, paste. So now I'm in the directory and then if you type ls, you should see similar things or the same, ideally. i just give you a few seconds to go there, everybody. So I'm assuming everybody's here. If not, let me know, type in the chat or speak up, ideally. Um, so the next thing is then we have updated our commands file a bit. You saw that there I had this commands.txt file and we've an updated one and that we just quickly get now. So we have prepared a wget command. I put it in the chat and you just run that. Um, Back here, I'm also running it now. So that should be rather quick. Um, and then if you type ls, you just have one more uh, file that's called commands updated text txt. Just be careful about uh, getting the, the command from the chat because they are now appearing below each other. So it's the W get command that you want. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. It starts with W get. I can also show it. Well, you see it in my screen here, I guess. It starts with W get and goes until the end, basically. Um, I'm assuming you have that, hopefully. Um, if not, let me know. So what I would then do basically, and also I have some for you just visual like just to try so, so that you don't get lost. I have kind of what I uh, is here on the right. You see this new directory uh, that's basically for the genome mapping. And we will create some directories inside of this directory. So this is basically now our home directory where we will do everything. And just to get ready for the day, we start, you should also, um, be able actually, because you have that text file, now you should be able to open it. And that was with. Um, then you do mouse pad and the, the text file does that actually work. Yeah, um, I always have to see where it is actually myself. So there are several different ways how you can get there. You can just type mouse pad in your um, terminal and then you have to go via um, 
file and I think open. Um, maybe I do that very slow. So you type, the first thing you do is type mousepad. That's what I did. Maybe you've done that before, but um, okay, yes. I just see that you're on a Mac and can't talk, copy paste, so it's a bit slow. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a bit of an issue, to be honest. Um, yeah, just let me know if I go too fast and then I can just slow down a bit. I assume you have that file at least. So now if you take mousepad in your terminal, what I just did, it will open this untitled mousepad. And then you, um, maybe I just cancel that. You go on file and open because you want to open that particular file now. And then it's important, it's a bit difficult, I find, to, man, uh, to kind of go through this directory. But what I did is with other locations, I think, and then on computer. And I found the directory called vol. And then it's vol volume and 4B genome mapping, basically. So if I go in vol, I find volume. And I go into the right one that we just did. And then you can basically have your commands update a text file and open it. So you have it basically next to your terminal here. Shall I wait a bit or shall I explain that again? If I don't get any objections, I just wait a few seconds and then move on. The file was in, um, wait, maybe I just pretend to open it again. Where is my cursor now? Okay, that looks a bit weird now. Notepad um, file open um, other locations this green plus sign here and then it's on computer and there is vol if you scroll down a bit you might find vol. And then inside your 4B sum uh, directory, you should find the updated text file. If I go now back to my terminal, I see that I cannot exit. Like if I exit and I close the file. So I'm wondering if I should maybe open a new one. Do you have the same problem, Alexander? Mm, can't see. Mm. My copy pasting ability is gone again. Yeah, we also have some copy pasting uh, problems. Oops. Oops, what am I doing now? So. Uh, this is a bit confusing. I c Alexander, I cannot open another. Wait, give me one second. Um, Do you want to open another terminal, Alina? If you click on the terminal icon at the bottom of the window, so if you put your icon. Yeah, I usually see that, but I don't see that. You put it a bit further down. You might need to click. Ah, oh, yeah, no, it, it appeared, it appeared. Sorry. So, yeah, maybe you also have done that. Um, I didn't know that this is an issue, actually. But what I just did is opening a new, you see, still see my screen, opening a new terminal where we just go into our directory again. And yeah, then we are good to go. We just work in this one. I wasn't aware of that. Um, if you can also do that, because in your old terminal, you might have seen that your cursor basically is just without anything, it's on the left here. And if you control C, then you would just exit out of your, um, you would close your text file, 
which is not what we want. So here in this case, I would just go in vol volume and for the genome mapping again, cd into it, type ls, see if everything is there. Looks good. Um, and just um, as a bit of background, so the uh, would be great if you have actually this command update text uh, open in a text editor, because then you copy paste within the virtual machine. So that should definitely work for everyone. Yeah, that was the thought why we do it that way. Um, I hope you have that. I just tried to monitor the chat a bit. Um, okay. Do you ha does everybody have that file? And if not, um, could you tell me? Okay, I just see that we have an issue. So if you unmute, I really have to mute Alexander because they don't hear you. There will are some dis disturbances. Okay, thanks Rafaela for saying. Um, yeah, we'll just try to, <laughs> if he unmutes, I'll mute. So, all right. Um, are you, do you have that file now? The one here because that basically contains all the commands you will need today and i just want yeah from there you can like alexander said that before but maybe you haven't heard it um you can basically copy it from this file because it's also on the virtual machine it should work like with um yeah for example let's say we want to run that command it's a bit hard to and then it should work like you can copy it and you should be able in your terminal to paste it there. Um, so I guess that's also what the next step would be now, because we now have to activate our uh, Conda environment for today, which is called microbial genomics. Um, so I would paste this command there now, Conda activate uh, microbial genomics and run it and then you see in the beginning of the uh, here like that you have microbial it says microbial genomics in parentheses okay i wait a few seconds and then move on so yeah, I maybe, yeah, I give it a few seconds. I wait a second. And if you want to show me, like, want me to show something again, uh, yeah, just also write it where you're lost. Okay, so you are good to go. I'm hoping everybody else as well. Um, so we have done this, we have activated our microbial uh, genomics uh, conda environment. And then just a bit of a little small background. It's uh, so what the, there are many tools out to um, do mapping. What we are going to use is a Burroughs wheel alignment uh, tool. Um, in this, I'm not going to go into detail how it works. There are different algorithms implemented for different types of data. So especially like different read lengths. If we have very long data, we would use another uh, very long DNA fragments. We would use a different one than uh, if we have very short ones, for example. So what we're using here now, because we are dealing with ancient DNA and have uh, short reads, we are using BWA Backtrack or 
AWAALN, align, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is uh, particularly suitable for Illumina sequences uh, up to 100 base pairs. And we're usually way below that. So um, that's why we, this is suitable here. There are, for example, BWAMM that is for way longer, um, like basically from 70 base pairs onwards, like up to a few thousands. Um, yeah, but it's not really required here. So to map, like Alexander said, of course, we need a reference genome. And this is usually in the fast A format. And ideally, if we are working with an organism where we have an, um, we have a, a uh, reference genome for that organism, we map, of course, to the right one. Sometimes this might not be actually available. So one could also map to a very closely related species or something. But in the, often where we get those from is basically from different databases, like the NCBI database. Uh, but of course, in this case, if uh, it's already in your directory and you don't have to get it anywhere. Um, so because in your directory, basically, I tried to show it a bit here. You have your two samples. It's sample one and sample two. And you have your reference FA file. That's a FASTA file, uh, which is called a diff. Uh, I think it's called, uh, that's wrong. Sorry. It's called um, ypestisco92.fa. That's your reference file. And of course, also you have your commands, text files, but yeah, I didn't include that here. And the first step to what we have to do is index our reference genome, basically, which makes it uh, easier for the next steps to kind of um, work. Or actually, it's essential for the next steps to work. And indexes, basically, there are different ways of indexing. Also, like if you have a phone book, it's also indexed in an alphabetical way because you don't want to go through the entire book to find something, but just like um, your name starts with le any letter and then you can go there and find it in a certain way. So it just it's kind of a way to organize it. And we are running now those three different tools require different types of indexing. We are running three commands here. And um, so I would like, I'm kind of changing back again to the terminal. And here I have my um, uh, text file. And here, right at the, uh, the top, it says index fast a file. And we just are going to copy and paste those three commands the BWA samples and PCAR. This is what I would like you to do now. And I'm also going to do it. So. And just make sure to be in your 4B genome mapping directory. Otherwise, it cannot um, find it. And you will see some stuff being printed to your term, um, terminal. That's just normal. Just tells you what it does. When one is run, you just go to the next one, which is the Santos one for me. Okay. I'll give you a few more seconds. If something is unclear, just let me know. Or if you want to see the commands again, um, it's those three here.
So since I also have this copy paste dish, like I also have to do it kind of manually with uh, like paste and copy. Um, I think I assume most of you are done or you're done. Uh, if not, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just move on now. So because if we are done with that, I want to just go into parameters briefly, only two of them. Um, and there two like those two parameters are just important to specify. It's one, the seat length and the maximum edit distance. The rest, everything else you will see in the command, we just leave for now, uh, set, like leave the default parameters. Um, because, yeah, and in general, those two parameters and also others depend on the type of data. And we generally differentiate between uh, linear and, and strict mapping parameters. So if you have um, reads that are um, like, there are some lab protocols that can remove the ancient DNA damage. Um, so you have kind of very clean uh, reads already who, that can map quite accurately to the uh, reference. Then we would more, use more strict ones. However, if you have a lot of damage in there, um, you would use more lenient parameters. And we're going to do both today, actually. But first, let's just quickly talk about seed length. Seed length, it's basically um, like mapping works with the seed and extend algorithm. And the sequence of the first n basis, n is what you specify in that parameter, is used to find a hit in the reference genome. So if n is 4 and it's a, t, c, g, it will try to find map like um, a, c, t, g in the reference genome and try to extend it from there. It looks if the rest of the reach of the DNA fragment also works at that point of the reference. Um, and this basically seeding speeds up the alignment. Um, it can be disabled, like for example, if you set a very like you have reads that are roughly fifty base pairs, and you set a very long seed of a thousand or something, that's a lot longer than reads. So basically, it's kind of it acts as um, a seeding disabled in that way. Um, so that's the first one, or like just to recapitulate or just show what the difference between a short and long seed is. So if you have a short seed, it can, like I said, map to more possible positions in the reference genome, or it tries to map there. Um, it's a bit less accurate, but it allows for more differences, mismatches. So if you have very, um, like data with a lot of damage, um, this is good for in this case. However, it's also longer runtime because it has to try many more um, of these um, positions in the reference genome. However, you have a very long seed, it maps to less positions because it's more specific. If you have like, let's say 30, um, a sequence of 30 um, base pairs from the read and you take that and you try to map it, it will only map at very few positions probably, if maybe only one even. Um, it's more accurate. Um, and also it, it's faster because it just has a very few, um, um, very few positions where it can go. But it, if you have a less perfect mapping match, basically, if there are some mismatches, it might miss that. So um, you want to do that if you have very high quality data, basically. The other thing is the um, maximum edit distance. That's basically how many, like it specifies how many mismatches are allowed in a read. This can be, you can set that as a fixed number, I think. Um, however, you have diff like your reads are diff have different lengths. Some are very long, rather long, some are rather short. So having the same for all of them is not really ideal. So here, um, basically, what we are doing, we are. This is a bit hard to explain for me as well. Um, so you have. Um, I found this visual um, thing in the eager pipeline documentation. Basically. Um, it depends on how you, you enter how many, um, how long your read is. In this case, I just entered 50. Let's say we assume you have a read length of 50. And then you set um, this end parameter, which is the maximum edit distance parameter, um, to 0 0.01. And you see this red bar here, or like the red line on the bottom, and where it intersects with this curve, basically, which um, 
on the x-axis, I said it's allowed mismatches in read. This is the maximum number of mismatches allowed. So here it's like three point something. So in this example, uh, we for a fifth uh, base pair uh, for a read of 50 base pairs, we allow for three mismatches in a read. However, if we um, set that more strict, so if we set the bar higher, or the line higher, higher, this goes down to roughly two, I would say. Maybe it's even a bit less. Um, so on the bottom example, we would allow for two mismatches if it's a bit below less and it's actually only one mismatch. So it scales with the length of the read. And yeah, this is basically the difference between if you have this, this 0 0.01 number, which we are going to be using as well, you know you allow for more mismatches um, in a read in respect to the reference. And if you set this uh, to 0 0.1, basically, you allow for, um, sorry, did I say the wrong way? One first one, you allow for more mismatches, and second one, you allow for less mismatches. Maybe a comment from my Wait, wait, wait. I have to mute. OK, so just a comment here, because um, also we find this a bit uh, difficult to understand. Um, so it is actually hard to uh, understand this BWA parameter directly. There are other mappers that would allow you to give you a percent identity, for example, here, which would be more easy to understand. So I think um, what you just need to take home is what Alina uh, just explained, basically the the smaller values mean it's more lenient and the, the larger the value is, it is more strict. So that is actually sufficient, I think, for all of us to understand in this context. Also, the documentation of BWA will not uh, help a lot. It is a quite a cryptic parameter when you want to go into the details. All right, then basically what we set as lenient uh, parameters is we allow for more mismatches with this n parameter to 0 0.01 and we take a shorter seed length of in this case dash l seed length 16 and if we go for strict mapping for then we would allow for less mismatches with the n parameter to 0.1 and a longer seed length of 32 um, yeah, we, we will actually be doing that. So um, we'll come to that, back to that again. So what Alexander already said, we are working with pre-processed files. So they are um, basically adapters that have already been removed and they are ready to be mapped. We have those two input files that I mentioned, sample one and sample two. And I should say one of these is an ancient genome and one is a modern one. We're not gonna say which one, but you'll find out, I guess. Um, and then we apply both of those parameter sets, basically the linear parameter set and the strict parameter set to each of those samples. And we go through one of these together um, now, basically. And then we also would like you to, do, to go through another one at least, um, or as, as far as we get, I guess, um, to repeat that, but with another sample or with another parameter set. Um, so for those four mappings, um, we will make four separate directories. So it's genome one or sample one lenient, sample two lenient, sample one strict and sample two strict. Um, basically, we just do it in four separate directories just to avoid mixing up files. That's the easiest. Um, as long as when you work, uh, when you do something like that, and as long as you name them in an informative way, it's fine. But yeah, for the sake of this course, we just do it like that. So we are going to, in our 4B uh, genome mapping uh, directory, we are going to do, uh, do those four directories. So you run make directory, which you probably learned, and then all those four names of the directories. So. Oops, so this is the command here. I'm in my text file. Oop. Can I? Yeah, okay. Um, so I would copy that, go to my terminal again. And also, by the way, you saw that you have a bunch of new files that are just the indexed files of for the reference genome. And now 
you run that. So what you see then is basically four directories in this purple blue color here. I just give you a few seconds again. So while this is um, while this is running, or actually while uh, everybody makes sure to be in the right directory, um, so there is a question uh, by Nikolai or suggestion about the the minus n parameter. Um, so I have to admit I'm I'm not entirely sure how to understand it. I mean, you make a suggestion that this is um, uh, basically a logarithmic way of understanding the number of mismatches. But of course, what it also includes is first of all an error model. This is what I understand from the BWA documentation. Um, it um, basically includes an error rate that it assumes. And second, it also includes the uh, length of the read. But apart from that, I think it basically follows the logic that you have outlined in the, in the chat. However, under the assumption of a certain error model and also including the length of the read, which makes it a bit hard to follow this logic um, just on the top of our heads. And that's why uh, and that's why Alex Pelzer, who has actually developed this tool that Alina has shown you, made this kind of or turned the formula into this visualization. So you can basically just add the read length there and then read the number of mismatches depending on the parameter. So this is as far as I understand it. So, okay, thank you. And I hope you have all those, you all have those directories now. Let me know if not, but then I would move on. So, so we just begin with one of them. I just chose sample one lenient. Um, it doesn't matter, but we are just going to go into that sample with CD sample one lenient. And yeah. I guess you don't have to copy paste that. You can just go sample one lenient. CD sample one lenient. So then you should be in there. You see nothing because there's nothing in there yet. So I hope everybody's in there. Um, so yeah, just make sure to be in your uh, in your file, uh, well, directory, not file. And then we take the next command. So we basically create a file for the BWA alignment, which is here sample one, and specify the lenient parameters here, as you can see. Somebody's currently marking that. Okay, but you should see. So it's that that um, n dash n is zero point zero one and dash L, the seed length is 16. So this is the parameter set for lenient. Um, so, and then here we have our um, reference file because, and it's, it's two dots basically um, because it's one uh, directory further up. So we have to give it the relative path to the directory. And also the same with the input file. And then basically we direct it into this reads file.sai as an output file. So I will also be doing that. Um, Yeah, I will print something to your screen. Saying it's calculating stuff. So yeah, we just wait until that's done. And also I should say maybe later if we also do that for other genomes, it can like the time, how long things take differ quite a bit on the type of mapping we are doing and on the type of input we have. So of course, if you have a huge input file, it will just take longer naturally. 
but also the set of parameters um, like as um, will make a change in how, how long it will take. So don't be confused if at some point you might wait a bit. As long as it's still doing something and not throwing an error, you're good, I guess. So it's done for me now. So maybe also for some of you, but I just wait a few more seconds. So if you type ls, you should now see your reads file.sai as well. And yes, let me know if you're not there yet, but also I'll just say what the next step is. You'll find it in your commands file anyways. So the next file is basically the second step of the mapping now. Um, this dash R specifies the read group in a certain format. It looks a bit um, complicated. Don't worry about it. Um, and there was a question by Nikolai, if we typically disable BWA seeds seeding when aligning ancient DNA reads, um, I know that like if I map to a human reference genome, I would disable it. However, for pathogens, and we are mapping here to the Y pestis genome, Yersinia pestis, uh, causative agent of plague, this, uh, we are not doing that. Usually if we get shotgun sequences and we just screen, through the screening, we use uh, um, even the short um, uh, seed length of 16. And then if we have capture data that's high quality, we would go with a longer one. Do you want to add something, maybe, uh, Alexander? I'll just mute myself. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Alina. I mean, I think, um, Nicola, that's a, that's an important question. I would actually like to see an evaluation on that because disabling the seed makes it actually quite slow, particularly when mapping to the human genome. And I'm wondering if there is really any difference in sensitivity um, between just using rather short seeds such as 16 or maybe even a little bit shorter um, or disabling it completely. I can imagine it's definitely much uh, longer runtime if this uh, seed is disabled completely. And certainly one could argue that the sensitivity will be a bit higher, but I'm really wondering if it, the sensitivity makes that much of a difference. Um, so that's why on bacterial genomes, we usually do not use that. And I'm wondering if it really makes a big difference on the human genome either. Um, I think increasing the sensitivity, the way Alina also described it with the seed and the stringency makes uh, a lot of sense due to the damage. If we have data that has damage patterns, but I think um, disabling the seed might not be necessary if the settings are uh, right. Rafaela, is that what you mean with Google Docs? Do you want me to link to the slides? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Are you sending it, uh, James? Or should I do it? Uh, I lost the tab, so if you send it up, please. Um. Try that. Perfect. So, and the next step on the max, uh, like I said, there's part two of the mapping where the regroup is specified. We also have, again, to give the path to faster file and the basically input file, the, the file we just created before. Also again, to our um, file that we are gonna map, so sample one. And then we, again, um, directed into a reads mapped.sam file this time. So if you take that, go back to the terminal. I already copied it, so I just paste it here. No, that was the wrong one. Uh, I had copied it and I copied something else in between. Oh. 
Und jetzt nimmst du immer das Komma als Fall. Ja, yeah, so it's running for me now. Hopefully doing the right thing. And this will also take just a few seconds or, yeah, seconds in this case. Um, so some of you might have run it already. Um, I just wait a few seconds again um, and then move on. And if you're not there yet, let me know. I'll write in the chat. And Alexander wants to say something. And by the way, if you miss any of these commands, um, you will find all of them in the commands file uh, in the right order. So they will actually appear in the commands file in the same order that they also appear in the slides. So I see some people prefer to take uh, the commands from the slides, which is fine. Um, maybe others prefer to take them out of the commands file, uh, but just making, uh, making clear that you find them in both places. All right. Um, so I just type a let's see that we have our files and we have a sem file in D that looks good. So we have still have the previous one plus the new one now. Um, so the next step basically is what we do, we have a SAM file now that stored all the mapping information and we want to transform that into a binary format, basically. It's just easier to store it in that format and for the further processing. So for this, we use SAM tools and SAM tools is basically a toolkit that allows you to explore and handle and post-process uh, SAM files. Um, here in this case, we use SAM tools view uh, the B dash B specifies that specifies that we want the output to be in BAM format. format. And I think S dash S is apparently not actually required anymore. It can be omitted in recent versions, but we just have it in here in this case. So you would take that um, that command and run it as well. And let's see. looks good. And wait until it's done. So if you type a let's again, that shouldn't take long the transformation. You see that you still have your SAM file, but you also have your BAM file now in the middle here. Reads mapped BAM. So I'm assuming you are there. So basically also what Centrals can do is sort um, the alignments because now we have all those alignments in that BAM file and it can sort them by the left mark co most coordinates. So from the reference genome, it would just go from all the reads that are in the beginning of the um, a reference that I'm mapping to the beginning of the reference and takes like one to sort them in, in a specific order. And sorting can often help to um, speed up later uh, stages of an analysis. So what we are just going to do that here, we, we will use that Santos um, command, Santos sort, and take it. And what we are going to do is like we like sample sort, then the input file, and then we direct it into a new file that we just call the same, but we add like sorted to it. Um, so we don't get confused. Well, we don't start mixing things up. So paste. If you type then ls again, you will see that you have your additional reads mapped sorted BAM file now. And yeah, you, if I'm too fast, you let me know. Maybe I'm even very slow. Um, so basically, any BAM file can be indexed, um, which can be also more efficient than for further processing. So you can also run the SAM tool index, SAM tools index file. So you see SAMTools, this toolkit is quite versatile. You can do a lot with this. It has an index command as well. And then you just give it the um, 
yeah, the input. So I will just copy it from here, or you take it from your notes here, um, and run this command as well. It should go rather fast, I guess. So you have your, in addition to your reads map sorted BAM, you have your reads map sorted BAM Bay, by however you want to call that. Um, yes. So I can wait a few seconds if you want to, otherwise I would move on. So what we are doing now, because now we have all the reads that map, but during um, the basically part that happens in the lab when we extract DNA and transfer them into libraries and so on, we amplify the DNA fragments quite a lot. And this is, of course, um, not really biologically meaningful. It's just like we have the, the very little DNA we have in there, we have to amplify it to, um, to get a, to a certain amount. Um, so what we want to do is now deduplicate it. So we only uh, keep each like one read um, of the reads when we have like five of the same reads I can show that on the next slide actually you see here we have a lot of the same reads here um that are exactly the same they start at the same they end at the same and here they have all those three snips here um so we just want to keep one of them and also of this block we want to keep one here's only one in this case and so we want each read once and that's what we are going to do now and their essentials again, uh, because we're still working with our BAM file, has this rmdup, um, basically a command. Um, so you rmdup duplicate removal, basically. And this dash s is basically, it, do, it uh, removes the duplicates for single end reads. And because by default it works for paired end reads only. I'm not gonna go into detail, we just, in this case, we have this type of data, so we need that. Um, so I'm taking that command index I had, copy it from my text file, and then go back to the terminal and run it. Yeah. So if you type ls, you will see we have one additional file in there that's called readmap sorted data BAM. And like with any other BAM file, we can just index it as well, um, which is the next command, um, send to index again. And we just run it on this as well. And you should see that you have also that sorted data BAM by file then. I wait a few seconds again. So I guess you are done. If not, please let me know. Um, then after we've done that step here up here, we can have a look at BAM files basically. Also, SamTiles view provides a way to look at the BAM file itself. Just open it 
because we don't want to paste the entire BAM file, which is huge to the um, terminal, to the console, we just use this less command that I'm pretty sure you probably heard about in the bare bones bash session. Um, it's just basically type uh, paste as much as fits in the terminal, but you can scroll up and down. And dash uh, caps, capital S is just so that the lines don't continue in the next uh, line, basically, when they're too long. So it will just cut them off, basically. So if you do that, and we go back, then we paste it. Come on. Got an S here, SAM tools view, reads map sort to beat up BAM, and then we pipe it into less. You will see something like this. Um, there are several columns. Among them are the read itself. Here, the read sequence, basically. Um, and what is cut further to the right, what we which is kind of cut off here would be a quality. I think it's a quality. Maybe Alexander, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. So the um, I mean, what we see at the very right, or actually we can't see it fully. So if uh, Alina, if you move a little bit to the right, so there is the, the sequence of the read. But then, can you actually move a bit further? Does that work? Doesn't? Okay, that's a pity. But what actually um, uh, comes right after that is the the, um, the fast queue quality string that we have talked about before. Uh, so you have, and now it's working, you have actually the initial quality uh, string also in there. And then comes also a number of entries that are rather specific to the mapper that is used. But maybe we can talk about some of the uh, columns to the left that are pretty standard for SAM format. Should, should I just quickly do that? So um, you have the, the read name in the very first column. Um, in the second column, uh, that tells you actually how the read has been mapped. So you, you see here a lot of zeros and 16s. This is in encoding again. So zero means it is a forward mapping read, and 16 means it is a reverse mapping read. Um, and there are a lot of other features that mapping reads can have, particularly paired end reads, but we do not have that here. So we have only zero and 16. Four would, for example, mean it is an unmapped read. Here we see only mapping reads. Next column has the identifier of the sequence that the read is mapping to. Now you might say, well, I mean, I know that must be mapping to my genome because that's what I used as a mapping target, but of course, there can be multiple target sequences in your FASTA file. Just think about the human genome. We'll have a sequence for each chromosome. The chromosome number will then appear in that column number three. Um, then uh, the next column is actually the, the mapping position. So position in the genome, you see the reads are sorted. We have small positions here, and that goes up to several millions um, if we would go further down. The next column that shows 37 uh, always is actually the mapping quality. And um, that can, 37 is actually the maximum for single end reads that BWA will calculate. Now mapping quality is something where also every mapper has their own formula, one could say, or at least there are different uh, mapping qualities that other mappers will put out, but the higher the better. And actually for single end reads and BWA, uh, that we are using here, that's 37 is the maximum, and zero is the, the minimum. And uh, the next column is actually the cigar string. Um, that's the last column that we should maybe talk about. And that tells you how the read was, uh, was mapped. So for example, if there are insertions and deletions um, that the read was mapped with, and when it, it basically says um, like 35N, you see here a lot, that's basically uh, direct alignments, no insertions, deletions. However, sometimes there's a bit of a misconception. People think this means 35 matches and there are no snips. That's uh, not the case. So even if there is a mismatch, it would also be uh, 35M in this column. 
So it does not tell you the number of SNPs in the read. Um, and that's basically now the information that's contained in, in your alignment file for every single read, for millions of reads. And for every read that has been aligned, there is one line, entry line, in the SAM file. Okay, so if you want to ex exit that again, you just hit Q. And it, if you're actually in that window, it should let you out again. And you have your console back. And um, another thing. So we can also look at another thing. Um, if there are different statistics, like different things you can specifically look at. So if we, let's say we run the next command. Samples IDX stats on this reads map sorted data BAM. It will print something to your console. Alexander, do you want to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, we have seen this, uh, the, the SAM file before, and now, um, I mean, first of all, you could just process that yourself, right? You could apply certain filtering criteria yourself and say, you know, give me all the reads that map to the forward strand or reverse strand. And what should say, for all of these, filtering concepts that um, you might have in mind that you would like to apply to such a, a file, SAM tools has actually something that does it already for you. Uh, for example, if you want to extract all reads that map to chromosome four, if you want to extract all reads that have at least a mapping quality of 20, or if you want to extract all reads that fall within a certain genomic annotation, say, reads that overlap with coding genes, something like that. If you want to do that, SAM tools has already a function for you that does it. So there is no complicated scripting needed that compares coordinates. And that's all functionalities of SAM tools. And also, and that this is what we are looking at here, if you just want to get a rough overview of the number of mapping and unmapping reads, you don't need to do this counting yourself, but basically, um, very roughly, SAM tools IDX stats is already doing that for you. So it shows you all the different uh, target sequences. In this case, we have only one. We don't have multiple chromosomes. We only have one, as it's a bacterium. And the first uh, uh, column basically contains the identifier of that sequence. Um, and just as a side note, so this NC number, that's actually an identifier that you will find for Yersinia pestis reference genome. Uh, in the database in NCBI, so the 3143 version one. Um, and the second column is the length of this reference sequence. In this case, as I said, only one, 4.6 million nucleotides, uh, the length of the Yersinia pestis genome, and uh, then the number of mapping reads. So that's 2.3 million, uh, and the number of unmapping reads, as you can see below. So that's a really slow, slow number, uh, sorry, low number. So uh, that's um, only around 100,000 mapping reads. It already might give you an idea if this is a modern or an ancient sample. Um, as you see, really high number of mapping reads, really low number of unmapped reads. Um, it can give you more information if you have more chromosomes and paired end reads, which is not the case here. So basically, the next step is actually new again. It's ge yes. uh, genotyping. So, so shall one second. Got it. Uh, are are you going to share or am I going to share? Yeah. So my suggestion is that you keep sharing. So I don't know okay. if we have the issue with my sharing again. Okay. Um, but I will guide uh, through the slide. So. so <laughs> so I will keep sharing, but Alexander will be talking. Thanks a lot, Alina. Um, yeah, so now if, if we are at that step, and I would actually also like to emphasize um, if you for any reason have not gotten to that step, of course, we can 
uh, we can help you um, after we have gone after we have finalized this and there's actually only basically one more command that we need to prepare our data for that sample um, but if uh, if you for some reason cannot generate the final results files we will actually also provide them in a later stage so that we can then all look at them in a genome browser and of course we will also guide you through that so don't worry should uh, there be any issue that prevents you from creating the final result file so this will be provided and of course everything will be um will be demonstrated what i uh, also would like to say is that of course now we are doing that to really look under the hood we are basically running the commands one by one as alina has demonstrated um and checking the results checking if, if everything's there of course, that is something that you would in, an, uh, in a real application not do. I mean, either, as I said at the beginning, you have a nice and convenient NGS processing pipeline in place, or you would actually have a file that maybe would not look too dissimilar to the, um, to the commands file that uh, Alina has, has shown you and used for copy pasting the commands. So you have actually a script that contains all of these commands. And the script is, what you would be manipulating, what maybe a colleague has shared with you, and where we hope uh, that by getting a bit of a look under the hood, as we are doing it here, um, you would then be able to understand potentially better and also manipu uh, manipulate it if needed. So um, Alina has actually guided you now through this whole mapping process, and you see that this is not just one command, basically saying, take my reads and map them, uh, is something that has already quite a number of steps that are necessary, like indexing the genome, mapping the reads, indexing the, the read mapping files, sorting that, removing duplicates. There are potentially other filtering steps that you would like to apply um, that we have not done now, for example, certain quality filters, read length filters, and so forth. When you are then happy with your mapping, like um, you, for example, do what we now have done. You check the number of mapping reads. The quality distribution is the quality uh, actually as you expected and so forth. And when you are happy with that, the next step would be genotyping. So basically really having a program in this case, going through your mapping and determining where your reads consistently deviate from the reference sequence that you have been mapping to. Um, so basically, you want to identify all SNPs that differentiate the genome from your sample from the reference. And this is based on the read mapping in this case. So we use um, for that here the Genome Analysis Toolkit, GATK, um, developed at the Broad Institute. Um, and that is uh, a tool that has a number of capabilities, not only uh, genotyping, but genotyping is one of them, and we use that there. There are other genotypers out there as well. So we use this as an example. It's a widely used tool, but there are others as well. It also takes the same reference genome as an input, and it takes the mapping that we have just generated. And what it actually creates is a so-called variant call format. And um, we will take a very brief look into this now. So uh, you remember the multi-column uh, format of, of SAM, uh, and here we have also a multi-column format. So in this screenshot, this is not well aligned, but just to give you a very short overview here. So the first column, similarly um, to other formats, has in this case the sequence identifier of, the, of your reference. This is now from a uh, human genome mapping. So you do see in the first column, it says chromosome one. It uh, basically gives you the, the position of a variant that has been detected. So you see that this is not continuous because of that there are not variants being detected at every position, but only at some positions. Um, and then it can have an ID, um, particularly for the human genomes, already known SNPs have IDs. The next two columns basically tell you which nucleotide has changed into which other one in the sample. So for example, T to G, A to G, C to T, T to C. Then you get also some quality values, filtering results, and what you see in, at the very right is actually the genotyping result. So I don't want to um, mention all of these numbers and what they mean, but for example, what you see in the last column uh, as a first entry is, for example, 0 slash 1 or 1 slash 1. 
So this is actually referring to either heterozygous or homozygous calls of the genotype that you see in this um, in this row. So similarly to SAM files, this is also a file that you will only very rarely even take a look at. Um, and rather have that processed also by other programs as we will do now. But first, we need to generate it. And that we find on the next slide. So there is a command that is calling the unified genotyper. Um, and this is something that we would uh, like to run now, maybe from, from there or from the commands file. Okay, thanks, Alina, for um, placing that command. So you see now that it also generates some, some output. Um, and it takes actually uh, some time to run, not too long. And it gives you even an estimation um, how long it thinks it will be running, which is here like one and a half minutes. So just take your time, get this command running. And um, knowing that it will take about one or two minutes, if you want a short break, that is a good time. OK. So um, okay, so this should now have uh, finished for all of you. There's a very important question in the chat. So we are using unified genotyper here, which is indeed not uh, developed anymore, not supported anymore. So that's actually a good question why we why we are still using it, and the reason why we are still using it is um, so we have compared it to the haplotype caller, and particularly for very low coverage genomes. Um, indeed, one could argue that uh, unified genotype will not necessarily produce um, a high quality output, but it does actually show how higher sensitivity on low coverage data that we unfortunately um, very regularly have. So we have also um, downloaded here an older version of uh, unified genotyper that, uh, sorry, of GATK that still contains unified genotyper still available. Um, I find it a bit unfortunate that they didn't uh, keep Unified Genotyper for legacy reasons, because it is actually for our applications uh, better usable than the haplotype caller. And I mean, we do get on low coverage genomes a lot of low uh, quality genotypes, but we are then rather filtering them downstream and still have them in the first place. So that is uh, basically one of the reasons and compatibility with um, other methodologies, but that's something we also want to explore if switching to another genotype might be worthwhile. Um, or even, you know, particularly there are also genotypers out there that have been uh, developed for ancient context and also, um, but primarily for human. So for um, for these applications, we were actually quite successful with unified genotyper and decided to stick to that for now. Okay. So um, I hope that you have been successful applying these, these commands in uh, basically getting from your FASTQ file, mapping to the reference genome, getting your mapping um, that is sorted, that is indexed. And then finally, what we have here uh, is the, um, the VCF file that is now containing all the variants. Maybe what we can quickly do is also check uh, out the VCF file in a similar way as we previously have actually uh, looked into the SAM file or into the mapping, but we don't need to spend a lot of time on that because as I said earlier, this is something you would not necessarily do by hand, but maybe we can just uh, have a quick look how our VCF file um, looks like. 
and we need to go down a bit. So we have an extensive header here that tells us a lot of meta information about the analysis. And what we then see here is a little bit different to the VCF that I have shown you before. So here we have really set it up in a way um, that, uh, that would basically create an entry for every single position. And this is particularly important for some of the downstream analysis that we are doing so that we really know the difference if at a certain position we uh, do just not have a, a genotype, but we do have a reference call, um, or if we have no data. So we need to be able to actually differentiate that. And this is why we actually set up the genotyper in a way that we really get an entry for each position. So what you see for the first positions is you have the dot slash dot in the very end. So this is just no coverage. So this does not mean that we have a reference call there, but it is basically um, no coverage at that position. And then when you see the, the zero slash zero, what, you, what we see as a genotype in the following um, entry lines is that we have reference calls there. So that is actually very important for us um, to differentiate. So uh, there is also a question in, this, in the chat about human genotyping. So I'm not entirely sure for all um, of the applications. So we are using it for microbial analysis only as far as I know. So we have other uh, callers that are used, for example, for SNP-based data, so for SNP capture. However, I don't know what, uh, what colleagues prefer to use for uh, whole genome analysis. So I don't think that unified genotyper is what people would actually use there. So there are specific callers that have been developed for ancient uh, human data, um, and that would be used for full genome analysis. But I know for sure that uh, for the SNP capture data, um, another uh, genotype would be used, so not the unified genotype. Okay, so maybe we can go ahead in the in the presentation. So. Um, we will skip a few concepts, but I would still like to give you a good overview. I mean, this is an example from a table that we have actually published like that in a paper. Um, so what you actually want to end up with now is not this kind of VCF for each of your genomes. This is, of course, an important step. But where you basically want to get at is at the information as you see it here. So basically, you want to include multiple genomes, multiple samples in your analysis, and then for each of the SNPs that you have identified, you want to highlight in which of the samples, so in which of the genomes you have actually detected it, and in which you didn't detect it. And this information is also what you would like to use for phylogenomic analysis, which is not the topic of today, but it is a practical that you will do tomorrow. But basically, um, the information that we have now gathered for a single genome is what you would also gather for many genome, uh, genomes and then combine in a table such as the one that we are seeing uh, here. So for this, we would do a comparative SNP analysis. Um, and there are multiple tools out there that can actually do that for you. So gather many VCF files and combine them into a, what we would call a SNP alignment. So what we are using here is the multi-VCF analyzer that we have coded at one point for this procedure. So that gathers SNPs from many VCF files, has various output formats and uh, summary statistics. Um, it can also integrate uh, exports or like results from other tools, such as SNPF, um, which performs a genetic variant annotation for you to basically tell you if a SNP has an effect on a protein coding gene or not. And then it can actually generate a table for you, as we see in the, in the next slides, where this information is then also contained. So you then get a table that tells you which of your genomes have which of the SNPs, um, which genes are affected by that, if these are synonymous or non-synonymous changes, and um, it also gives you a few other meta information on these genes, as we see on the, on the next slide. So basically, it can tell you what are the annotated functions of these genes, what is the amino acid change that the SNP that you have detected will actually cause, um, and so forth. So for the sake of time, um, we would actually like to move ahead 
um, and show you a bit what you do with the output of this tool. But just to illustrate that, um, when you run the analysis that we have now gone through, uh, actually on multiple files, for example, on all four files that we have uh, provided, and this is just also a single um, command, as you see here, it spreads over three lines, but it is a single command. It will actually gather multiple VCF files and uh, generate output for you. But this will not work now, as we have not gone through all four uh, samples in the directory. Um, so what we will provide you now with is actually the results that we would get from the multi-VCF analyzer, so we can actually explore that uh, a bit. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have to uh, paste the link to that actually in the in the chat. And for reasons that I also don't really understand, the whole copy paste business is also not working for me anymore. So I will now also have to go through typing this uh, this command. So what you're getting now is basically a tar file with the results. So we have all four deduplicated um, BAM files that we just, we've already created one, but you just get all of them in a, uh, in a results directory. And the, um, I think also the SNP file at the end then. So if we had run that um, additional command that we are not going to run now because we just don't have all the input files, then we would produce a SNP, um, SNP uh, file, basically. And that's what we are now downloading. I see it takes a bit. Um, I'm, I'm now at 19%. It might take a few minutes. I hope, yeah, I hope not longer. <laughs> so we can still look at something. Yeah, so this will take um, around five minutes. So that's another good opportunity for maybe a short bathroom break. Um, and um, I have already pasted the next command in the chat, which is just unpacking the file uh, as soon as it is downloaded. And once this is completed, we will actually have a little tour through the contents of this comparative SNP calling output and actually have also a little tour through our uh, genome mapping um, and have a look at that in the genome browser. So see you back in around uh, five minutes. Um, so for some of you, it might still be downloading for me just uh, finished. And then also Alexander pasted this char xf um, command. And then you just input the char file. I just run it already. Um, to just unpack it. And then basically what you should get is a, this bluish results backup folder. Also, I should mention, I could have, I should have CD'd up one directory. It's now in our lenient mapping directory sample one. It doesn't really matter for now because it's only to kind of show some stuff now, but I just want to have it mentioned. So as soon as it stops for you, you do this tar xf results backup tar uh, command. And I think we have now agreed on, because we are kind of running a bit out of time to just kind of demonstrate something, look into some of the files that we have got and 
Um, if you don't follow, maybe you just uh, look what we are doing. You can also just open it later or maybe at the same time if you want to. Yeah, thank you, Alina. So maybe we can uh, just briefly go into this directory. So this is the, what will actually come out. Um, Okay, super. Um, yeah, so this is what, what will actually come out of the comparative uh, genotyping if we go in there. Um, and you see basically a number of, um, uh, sorry, so this is now actually the complete set of results. Um, and if you go into VCF out, this is actually the um, results of the comparative genotyping. Um, if that is run on all four or on all two samples. Exactly. And if you check the, the content of this directory, we see a number of files here. And I just want to point out a, a few of them. So, for example, we have a file that is called SNP statistics. That's actually a rather uh, a simple table. So maybe we can take a, a brief look at that. Um, and here I suggest to just open it with S, with less skin, exactly. And uh, what it tells you is basically here for all samples that have been included in the analysis, um, a number of uh, numbers. So. We have actually the sample name in the first column, and then we have the number of SNPs that have been uh, called. Um, and in this case, you see that for sample one, the number of SNPs is much lower than for sample two. In this case, the result uh, or the, the reason for that is actually that these two samples sit in very different positions in the phylogeny. So have different distance also to our reference sequence. This is why we call different numbers of um, of SNPs. We see also genome coverage that's kind of around 16 for sample one, around eight, nine for sample uh, two. We see the percent of the genome covered and the number of more numbers that, uh, that I don't want to elaborate now. If we go back to the number of SNPs, um, sorry, Alina, I just want uh, this one thing. If we now differentiate lenient and strict parameters, we do see that we actually have a higher number of SNP calls with lenient mapping than with strict mapping. But it's not tremendously more. It's just a little bit more. Um, so one could actually argue that this doesn't make a big difference. But in a minute, we will actually take a look at some of these differences and we will see that it does make a difference. Um, so although the coverage is very similar, almost identical, number of SNP calls is very similar, almost identical. We actually will see some qualitative differences uh, between these two parameter sets. Maybe we can also take a brief look at the SNP table itself. I mean, we don't need to understand that in its completeness, um, but this is actually a table that uh, will contain these kind of hundreds and or more than a thousand SNPs for some of the samples. And actually, you see here that is in a very simplified form. So you have the genomic position in the first column, then you have the reference nucleotide, and then for each of your four samples, or in our case, also different parameter settings, you are getting the uh, genotype call at that position. And what you do see here is that there are quite some differences between sample one and sample two. But when we look at the different parameter settings, we do actually see there are little difference. So in most of the cases, the two parameter settings are in agreement. But you do, you do also see examples where they are not. So for example, where we see an N in one of the columns and a character call in the other column, um, what Alina is pointing out here. So that a call of a SNP was not possible under certain parameters, but it was possible under the other parameter setting. And we will look at some of these uh, examples in a minute. Um, what I would also like to point out, although we will not go into detail there, is that we have also the same information 
um, as a, a multi-faster alignment, actually. So this is called the SNP alignment. And I don't know if it makes sense if we look into that now, but maybe you can just do, we can quickly look into it. So that's uh, minus S, a little, little typo there. Thank you. Um, so what we see here is actually now a concatenation of all of these SNPs for each of the samples. And now this is not easily uh, readable. So what is actually nicely readable is the uh, previous table that we had to look at, but this is nicely human readable. What you use for phylogenomic software is what we are looking at now. And this is also what you will use actually in the phylogenomic session tomorrow. So not this very file that we are now looking at, but a file of that sort that contains comparative SNP information to create phylogenies. But now uh, let's finally take a step away from the command line and uh, have some nice visuals and check out actually the results that we have generated in what is called a genome browser, which is actually a tool that can explore such mappings as we, as we have generated them today. Um, and we use, in this case, IGV. So Alina was just typing IGV into the command line and the genome browser will start. So is there a possibility to make that a bit larger, do you think? Yeah, thank you. This is great. So um, what Alina has now done is she has clicked on, on genomes. You have, right? How, how did you open this window? Okay, now can you cancel that, please? Thank you, because what we want to do first is actually we want to load our reference genome. So we have to uh, click on genomes and then on load from file. Exactly, we already have it, but you won't have it. So that's why we go through the full procedure. And then we need to navigate uh, into our volume again and our genome mapping, and then select our FASTA reference file. Uh, and then now we have it twice. Yes, I've just also spotted a question in the, in the chat. I will come back to that. Um, and now what we will do through the file menu and open uh, as, a, as an input file is actually the mappings that we have generated. And I suggest we only take a look at sample two. Um, but of course, you need to go. It's now a bit confusing because we opened, uh, we unpacked our results actually in, in the sample one directory. Okay, and then we also open the other parameter setting. Thank you. So now we have to zoom in to actually see something. And there it is. And what we see here is now actually the results of the genome mapping. Um, so we have on the, on the uh, x-axis, we have actually our genome. And um, then we have, in this case, two tracks. So in the, on, on the top, we have the linear parameters, right? And on the bottom, we have the mapping for the strict parameters. And each of these gray arrows, these are actually arrows. I'm not sure if this is clearly visible. These are gray bars, that these are actually arrows, they point into a direction. So these are the DNA fragments, the reads that came from your sequencer that were encoded in your FASTQ file that you basically mapped to the genome and used also for genotyping. And here you see them now aligned to the reference genome. And now we can actually move around in the genome um, by just clicking and holding and dragging basically through the genome. On the top, you see also the scale. So we are at around position 2,300,000 uh, 
27,000. So, I mean, this is a large genome, although compared to the human genome, pretty small, as it is a bacterial genome. So by just looking at it, we can also tell already something about the quality, but um, we actually would like to show you a few cases where we do see clear differences between the parameter settings. Unfortunately, copy pasting does not work even when it usually works for you under the setting with this browser. So I will tell Alina now some positions that she has to put in this top coordinate field by hand. So let's have a look at 36472. And what we see here now is actually um, is actually a SNP that uh, we call under strict parameters. So this is what we see at the, the bottom. So just remember the top track is actually our linear parameters and the bottom track is our strict parameters. Now in the middle of the uh, of the screen, we now see um, a T in some of the reads under linear parameters. But we do see this T call, this, uh, it is actually a difference to the uh, reference. It doesn't appear in all of the reads, but only in some. And this is the reason why we actually do not call it under these parameters, because the reads do not agree. However, in the strict mapping, which you see in the bottom track, we see that all of the reads are in agreement. And that's why we have the SNP call there. So in that sense, this is a bit counterintuitive because it leads obviously to SNP calls in under strict parameters that we do not get under linear parameters. And the explanation for that is that under linear parameters, it can happen that you map actually a number of DNA fragments that come from a different organism. I should say this can also happen under strict parameters, but it will happen much more often when you use linear parameters. And these reads that come from a different organism will obscure your true SNP calls. Um, let's maybe have a look at some, um, some other coordinates, for example, 105, 579. Thank you. Maybe we can zoom out a bit to have a look at this uh, situation here. So what we see here, um, thank you, and maybe uh, we stay on that zoom level for now. What we see here is actually a situation where you have to the right reads that are displayed a bit differently in IGB. So instead of being gray, they are white. What this means is that they have been mapped with very low mapping quality. And this is what often happens at highly conserved regions. Um, and I'm not sure why we don't see that. Maybe you can scroll a bit up in one of the tracks. Uh, actually, a bit up to, to the very top. What we see here is that also in that region, the coverage goes up. So you see this gray coverage track, which comes above the reeds, actually. And this goes also like fairly up. So we have also a much higher coverage on that area than we expect for our genome, um, which also tells us that this is probably uh, some mismapping from another organism. I mean, I should also mention at this point, usually we would filter these reads out. So we would apply a mapping quality filter. So these reads would disappear. In this case, for this tutorial session, we didn't do that. Um, there are sometimes also reasons why one wouldn't do it because you might want to have a look at these regions, right? It's just, it needs care. It needs a careful decision if you um, want to keep those low coverage mapping uh, reads on it. Um, finally, I also would like to answer the question in the chat. So, um, exactly. So the question is, why do we concatenate SNPs rather than, than genes? That uh, is particularly due indeed uh, to the fact that we have ancient genomes. So we might have low coverage data that would not allow us to have a proper consensus sequence for all genes. So we rather concatenate SNPs. Um, that makes it much easier. But um, that is actually something we would also do for modern genomes, just to have the compatibility. Um, there is also a question like, 
how would we actually include modern genomes in our multi-VCF analyzer output? And the answer is that uh, if we have short read data for these modern genomes, we would just go the same way for the modern genomes in comparison to the ancient ones. Maybe with stricter mapping parameters, because we know we don't have damage and so forth. But otherwise, we would do the very same thing. Now, what we actually do if we have um, complete genomes, so if we don't have short, short read data, but just a large genomic sequence, what we actually do and what has been quite robust in the past is that we create pseudo reads from that genomic sequence and then go through the same procedure. Uh, that would that also makes it possible to basically use consistent parameter settings um, and so forth. Um, maybe there is one more example that we can look at and have a look at in the genome browser at position uh, 758 zero, zero, zero. That's it. Thank you. So if you zoom out here. Even more, even more. Thank you. Um, and maybe if you move it a little bit to the right, a little bit downstream, so to speak. So what we see here, um, no, actually, the, the, uh, I thought about the other way. Thank you. What we see here is, I mean, what, what has happened? So why don't we see any reads here? Um, and we also don't see a difference between the parameter settings, right? So doesn't matter what parameters we use, there's just nothing coming here. And maybe, Alina, you can find out uh, if we score further down when we actually get something. There's a little bit there, whatever that is. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, it goes on and on. And there seems to be the other end. So what we have actually found here is a large genomic deletion. So we have, in comparison to the reference genome, so we have actually a large part of the reference genome. I have not paid attention to the coordinate scale, but let this be 50 KB or so um, that has not been covered. So basically, this is also observable uh, from our mapping data. So we can, to summarize, detect single nucleotide polymorphisms and combine them, for example, for phylogenetic analysis. We can find short uh, indels in individual reads, which are usually, however, not used for um, phylogenetic analysis, but they are used for functional assessment, similar to what I described in the lecture this morning, such as pseudogene analysis. But we can also have a look at large genomic deletions and in, uh, insertions, particularly deletions if we do a reference-based analysis. And this can also tell us something about the evolution of genome uh, structure. All of this is possible from uh, such a mapping that we have created uh, today. And um, maybe one short take home message regarding the parameters, even if, or even in cases where the parameters do not make a big difference with respect to coverage and number of SNP calls, in individual cases they can. They can uh, make the difference between a true SNP being called or not or they can make the difference between a false SNP being called or not. And of course, you want to avoid both. You want to get all your true SNPs and not miss any. But I would say even more importantly, you don't want to get false positive SNP calls because they will create problems during phylogenetic analysis. And particularly also during dating analysis because you will artificially uh, elongate your branches, and this will then create artifacts, particularly if you do dating analysis. Okay, so um, we are running a bit towards the end of our session, and I'm sure you also uh, want to lunch into your lunch break. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are any kind of last minute short questions that we should discuss before we close this session. If there are any questions that come to your mind later, you are, of course, um, 
you're of course also welcome to uh, drop me or Alina an email. So I see there is another uh, question in the chat. Exactly. So this is a question about um, about a reference biases that we observe. So a few, uh, just a few comments from my side about reference biases. I think this is a very important uh, question. And indeed, uh, I, I would say reference bias is unavoidable if you do a reference-based analysis. So we do mapping against the reference genome. We use that actually to perform uh, a phylogenetic analysis. And I would say to avoid any reference bias in such a setting is uh, close to impossible. So in, in this afternoon session, um, you will get an introduction into de novo assembly. So that is a reference-free methodology for reconstruction of genomes. But that comes, of course, with other challenges and caveats. Um, how can we avoid or at least, I mean, avoid maybe not, but how can we assess a reference bias? So would we get different phylogenies with different references? And I think that is exactly the right question to ask and to assess. Uh, so to basically repeat an analysis as we have now done with another reference and then basically observe if the phylogenetic analysis produces different results. So this is what we have regularly done in the past um, using rather different reference sequences, of course, for the same species, though. Um, and performing the analysis twice and then checking do we actually get uh, qualitatively different results from the phylogenies. Um, and usually that should not be the case. If it is the case, though, then, of course, this is something that needs further assessment. Okay, so uh, with that, I would like to let you go into your well-deserved uh, lunch break. And um, thank you for attending this session. And I wish you also a great uh, session in the after the Novo Assembly and interesting discussions uh, at your round table. So thanks a lot and see you around.